Closing good to defense. Uh, first of all, again, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I would like to thank you for your time and your attention to this matter. Um, we appreciate that you've been paying close attention, taking notes, uh, asking questions, and paying close attention to the facts and the evidence that have come out through the witnesses in the exhibits, not just what the prosecutor's arguments are or what my, uh, my arguments are. Those are our theories of the case. Um, we don't deny that there is a very emotional subject and topic here, and that is that there is a missing baby um, that has not been found, and there is questions as to uh, whether she is missing or if she is dead. But we're not supposed to decide cases based on emotion or sympathy. It's supposed to be based on the facts and the evidence that were presented towards you, uh, to you. Uh, the judge has given you instructions on that. Uh, which are enclosed in uh, the information that you uh, have been given. Uh, he has also gone over the elements of the crime. The prosecutor has touched on those. Um, but just to go over those in part, second-degree murder requires that the defendant, Sean Phillips, caused the death of Catherine Phillips, that he intended to kill her, um, that or he knowingly created a very high risk of death or great bodily harm knowing that the death or such harm would be the likely result of those actions. Uh, the killing was not done under a circumstance that reduces it to a lesser crime. Um, the defendant's position uh, is that the prosecution has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt those elements of second degree murder. There is an issue of whether a death occurred and there is no evidence of intent to kill or there's no evidence that he created a very high risk of death of great bodily harm, knowing that death or great bodily harm would be the likely result. An example of that would be as if somebody discharged a firework, an explosive into a crowd of people. That is an event where they knowingly did an act that would likely result in great bodily harm or death. That's not what we have here. The lesser crime that you should consider, if you believe beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a death and that Sean's actions were more than an accident, is involuntary manslaughter. Involuntary manslaughter in part requires, again, that the defendant, Sean Phillips, caused Catherine's Sean Michael Phillips. There's nothing to prove otherwise that this was a mutual uh, situation that they were looking into. And the reasons that even she admitted to uh, were uh, for the adoption of the abortion were rational. They were reasonable. She didn't say, well, he told me I had to have an abortion because he didn't want this kid for, you know, no reason. It was they were both young. We have two very young uh, adults, kids. Um, they had financial concerns. She's working part-time. He's in the National Guard. He's going to be deployed to Afghanistan. He's, they've had discussions that he's afraid that he's not going to come back. She's still in high school, wants to go on to college. Those are all reasonable explanations to explore the topics of abortion and adoption. There was no testimony that he ever threatened her to have an abortion, that he uh, made threats of violence. Uh, or anything to uh, Kate, to Ariel, nothing to support that. Considering an adoption or abortion doesn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there is a death or that there was an intent to kill. <clears throat> we also look at the birth announcements. They say that those went missing the first time they were found in Sean's trunk. The next time they come up missing, Ariel's first statement to the FBI is, um, in an interview, is they're missing, I think Sean threw them away. That's just a guess. She doesn't know. And then a few days later she goes, oh no, wait, we had an argument and he told me he threw them away. 
But again, whichever scenario is true, missing birth announcements don't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he had an intent to kill or that there was a death. Uh, we look at the statements of Dan Ruba. Uh, that happened about two months before uh, June 29th, sometime in May, uh, is his best recollection. While they're out in the garage drinking and smoking marijuana. Throughout the numerous times that he testified, he denied that there was marijuana and later that he admitted it. Um, Sean supposedly said that he could hide a body and they think that may have been from his military training. Unless you're in special forces, special ops, I'm pretty sure that the military isn't training people how to hide bodies. This is something that even they described as they're drinking and smoking marijuana out in the garage shooting the shit. I can't tell you how many odd topics they probably talked about while they were smoking and drinking. Again, that doesn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a death or there was an intent to kill. The only thing that that might prove beyond a reasonable doubt is you shouldn't drink and smoke marijuana. Ruba's other testimony is that Ariel was generally the loud and argumentative one. She was more of the uh, one that would yell, scream, and shout in arguments, uh, which was in contradiction to all of the testimony of how Sean acted. He was calm, he was quiet, he didn't raise his voice, he didn't yell, he never made any threats. All the times that the police were called uh, over disputes with Haley, no one was ever arrested, there was no domestic violence, um, nothing to show otherwise. Um, briefly just going over uh, what happened on June uh, 29th, and I'll get back to that in more detail, um, but Ariel leaves a voicemail regarding adoption. Sean goes and has his DNA testing done, uh, which isn't an act of something that if you're planning on not wanting this baby or going to commit a murder, why go show up early and comply with the DNA testing? If you didn't want the DNA or the child to be yours, one of the first easiest ways to do is just not comply with the testing. Uh, he goes over to Ariel, not to discuss adoption, not to argue. He, he, she even admitted they first went over there and they were going to fill out papers regarding Haley for her schoolwork. Uh, an argument happens, they go downstairs, whether it's to drive to the hospital or to DHS, um, they end up driving to DHS, the argument continues. Uh, Ariel gets out of the car, gets baby Kate out of the car, then puts her back in, gets back in the car, and they supposedly drive uh, back home to the apartment. She originally says that, well, I wanted him to take me to the hospital, but she also later admitted that uh, she said, well, just take me home. I'm going to go to the beach with Kate and some friends, and we'll do this some other day. Um, she gets out of the car once back at the apartment. They're not parked in a parking spot. They're just in the driveway area. Walks around the car, opens the door, unbuckles Kate, and then puts her back in the car, closes the door, and walks away. Sean drives away. He goes to Wendy's, where he told her that he was going to go, that I'm going to go get something to eat, probably to Wendy's, and run a few other errands. Um, and then... Uh, we get into uh, the issues with uh, his phone gets shut off, he's missing for two hours. And I'm going to come back and touch on more of the details of the events of that day. But um, we have Officer Custer and Officer Hartley then that show up after he uh, uh, gets home, calls the police. They arrive, he's pacing. They say he appears aggressive, but they also say, well, there could be a lot of other emotions that that could describe. Nervousness, panic, scared. But he cooperates. He calls the police. That's not something that if you committed a murder and you had a note that said, please call the police, that you're going to do. You would flee. You would run. That would be your response. You're not going to keep all of those items, uh, even if they were put in the trunk or in a pocket. That is actions of a young 21-year-old who ha made a mistake, made a poor decision, did something wrong that is panicking and nervous. But he cooperates. They pat him down and they say, what's in, your, what's in your pocket? It's her clothes. Clothes in a pocket do not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a death or that there was an intent to kill. They make a big deal about the diaper under the seat. But again, they don't test it for DNA. They don't find any fingerprints. 
and their own expert says there's nothing illegal with having a diaper under your seat. That doesn't prove that it was from that day. They don't know how old it is. And a diaper under the seat, not being illegal, doesn't prove intent to kill or that there was a death. Um, they make a big issue of him referring to baby Kate as it. Uh, Officer Custer, even in his own police report, admitted that his police report, he said, Sean stated, comma in quotation marks, she's with Ariel. And he later admitted that that wasn't the truth. But it also depends on how you ask the question. Where's the baby? It's with Ariel. Where's Kate? She's with Ariel. It's, it's all, they're making a big deal out of a word. And their own officers used and referred to the baby as it. Numerous times. That saying it doesn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a death or that there was an intent to kill. Um, the statements uh, made to Officer Custer and the interviews with uh, Detective Posma, uh, Sean admitted that he wasn't telling the truth to Officer Custer and Officer uh, Hartley. But even when asked, did you ask him, well, what's the truth or follow up? They never asked the question. Um, Detective Posma, during his interview, he wanted to put his theory across to, uh, to Sean, and Sean tried to interrupt him and tell him his side of the story a couple of times. Um, he was told to be quiet. Sean's actions aren't that of someone trying to cover up a murder. It is someone that is panicked, he's scared. What's outlined in his letter, he didn't seem real, he couldn't think, he was in shock, he was scared of it in the world. Those are all rational, feelings if this accident happened. Um, through their investigation, there's numerous parties involved. We have the Ludington Police, we have the Mason County Sheriff's Office, we have the Michigan State Police, the FBI, I believe Grand Traverse County Sheriff's Office, Oceana County, fire departments. Um, not going into specifics of which officers and which departments uh, went to every, uh, did all the searches and where, because um, I would take a lot of time. I know that you guys paid close attention, but they searched Ariel's apartment. They searched the Phillips residence. They searched Sean's car. Um, and I've touched on uh, some of those items that they found there, but um, they go to Wendy's, they look at Burger King, they found, go through the surrounding businesses. They don't find anything other than proof that Sean went to Wendy's. They go and they find Sean's shoes in his house, they're not hidden, they're laying right there on the floor, next to the bed, next to the chair, um, and they find some seeds on the shoes. Their own expert and their own testimony is, is they can't say when that got there or where it came from. Could have been a day before, could have been longer, and it could have been found, it, those seeds and sand could be found pretty much anywhere on western Michigan's coast. Um, those seeds and sand being on the shoes doesn't prove an intent to kill, doesn't prove a death. Um, they searched all over Mason County. They found nothing. We sat through a half a day of testimony from uh, two of the uh, lab techs. They collected tire impressions. Um, they referred to them as crime scenes, but actually they didn't find anything. It didn't match Sean's car. They pull up shoe impressions and tried to uh, mislead you guys that we found these shoes impressions and um, but then it comes out that they didn't match. They spend a day showing us pictures of a cabin and some woods and everything that you know it's a burial site and they dig it up and they find nothing other than I think some rodent bones. Those things they did a great investigation they put forth a lot of effort but they did not find anything in those searches just that they put forth all those effort does not show beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a death or that there was an intent to kill. Um, they searched Millerton Road, Limpke Drain, Sutton's Landing, DeVos Lake, Hackert Lake, EMS Lake, uh, the areas around Wildwood Meadows. Um, they put up a large map of all the red areas that they searched, but they didn't find anything of evidentiary value to support that there was a death or that there was a murder or that there was, and that doesn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt of an intent to kill. Um, again, I already touched on some of this evidence, the diaper, they didn't test it for DNA, there were no fingerprints. Sean's gloves that were in the car had his DNA. Those were his military gloves. Um, again, nothing illegal about that. 
The bottle that Dr. or that Officer Custer testified to that was in the diaper bag and it looked fresh, there were water droplets on it, trying to imply that Sean fed the baby or something else happened. They did fingerprint evidence of that. The only fingerprint on there was Ariel's. Um, they searched their computers. They found adoption searches on both computers. Um, but there were no searches of how to commit a crime, how to hide a body. Nothing on those computer searches proved beyond a reasonable doubt that there was an intent to kill, that there was a death. Uh, they looked at phone records um, and showed that uh, some of those that Ariel would call sometimes, and even her own admissions, sometimes 20, 30, 40 times a day. And Sean's response generally was to shut off the phone, power it down, and ignore the phone calls for a while. So the fact that he shut his phone off on this day for a couple hours isn't something out of the ordinary, isn't that he's trying to hide something. That was normal course of business between the two of them. Um, and the cell phone tower ping show that he likely shut his phone off. But again, that's what he generally did when she would repeatedly call of him. That's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt of an intent to kill um, or that there was a death. The prosecutor argues that they found nothing and so that that has to prove something. But nothing doesn't equal something. Just because they did all of this investigation doesn't mean that they've proven beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a death or that there was a murder or that there was an intent to kill. Looking at some of the witnesses, uh, Elena Campbell, she originally got up on the stand and testified that she never saw Sean. That was not accurate whatsoever. She testified in previous hearings and then admitted through her testimony that Sean and Ariel had a good relationship. There was no violence. They never really argued. She actually said she saw Sean interact with Kate. And Sean even came over to her house and helped out with her electrical problem. We have Chris Merriman that saw Sean drive down Millerton Road sometime a good time after 12 because his daughter was already home from uh, summer school uh, and he had fed her lunch but it was before 4.30 when his wife got home. Driving down the, old, the, the road that you actually live on doesn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a death or that there was an intent to kill. We have Abraham Hernandez, the fireworks. Uh, he testified that Sean brought fireworks from him the day that they were setting up. Sometime between, really he wasn't sure, they started setting up at around 11.30 and he got done mowing the lawn at 8.00. He was guessing that it was around 2.30, 3 o'clock, but he didn't have a watch on. He testified that he was in khaki shorts and what he thought maybe was a blue button-down plaid, but again, wasn't sure exactly of the shirt. But he didn't give his statement for about two months after the incident. He indicated that it could have actually been the day before. He's not sure. It, he was guessing as to what day it was. And there's no doubt that he bought, that Sean bought fireworks, but again, buying fireworks doesn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a death or that there was an intent to kill. We have Ellen Montgomery that uh, they bring on the stand who is nothing but an old lady that wanted to inject herself into a case. She saw an argument outside by a SUV or a van, which doesn't meet the description that was provided of Sean's car that it was parked in a parking spot. That's not what was testified to for the, uh, that it was parked uh, just in the driveway area. She didn't recognize the male even when showed a picture by the FBI. It admitted that she didn't see any facial features. She didn't, couldn't identify him until she saw on TV that maybe that's what they were looking at and she wanted to be part of the investigation. Again, that testimony doesn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt any of the elements of the crime. And we have Rashawn Burton. His statement, he spoke to Sean in July. He didn't write the letter until October 30th. That was after they had, they had filed charges in the murder, after there had been a prior kidnapping trial, after all of that information that he testified to was already out in public. Um, statements that uh, he didn't want a baby because of financial reasons. That was an argument made at the kidnapping trial. Statements that he could hide a body. Dan Ruba testified at the last at the trial of the kidnapping trial. Um, there's nothing in that letter that isn't in the media already. And he says that he didn't have the ability to know that information. He didn't have a TV.
But even though there's TVs in the common rooms, he even stole his bunkie's TV. And his other bunkmates had TVs. He said there were times that that happened. Um, he didn't provide any new information. All the things he gained could have been gained from media coverage, and the stuff that he did uh, support uh, weren't accurate. He said that they were trying to pin a baby on him that wasn't his. This is in 2013 when he's making that statement. Sean already had the DNA evidence and the results that, the, that Kate was his back in 2011, um, that she wasn't going to get any money from me. During this whole history, the only person that ever paid child support from one to the other was Ariel to Sean. Um, they state that there were 20 times that they were together in the law library or counseling, but that wasn't possible, even by Mr. Burton's own testimony. He was uh, from the end of August through October before he shipped out to a, another prison, was in segregation. Um, he uh, was having issues with his parole. He had been up for parole and denied and denied and denied. He also had his visitation uh, suspended, which is pretty much the most important uh, uh, thing that you can have in prison is you have visitation from outside people. He may have not had a promise from law enforcement or the prison uh, for his testimony, but it's reasonable to think that he was trying to figure out the best way to better himself. That he was hoping for his own expectation that maybe if I do this, I can get my visits back. Maybe if I do this, I can get parole early. Um, again, none of this proves anything beyond a reasonable doubt. There's nothing in his letter that says that there was an intent to kill, that it was thought out, that it was planned. Um, that doesn't rise to a level of a second degree murder. Um, and it, just looking at the uh, specific issue of death, the only evidence that they state that they have to argue that there is a death is Sean's letter. Otherwise, they don't have any physical evidence to support this claim. Just because she hasn't been found doesn't mean there's a death. This murder charge was filed again, as I stated, in October of 2013. That means at that point the prosecutor believes that they can prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a death, that Kate was dead. Their own lead detective's testimony was that in 2015, they looked into a possible connection with a baby doe in Boston. They sent Kate's DNA to see if it matched. And they're saying they did this because it's thorough investigation, which is fine, but look at the comments that uh, Detective Posma admitted to making in regards to that investigation. It's worth looking into, otherwise we, it wouldn't be worth doing. And nothing in the current case indicates a connection, but it doesn't mean a connection isn't possible. A possible connection is a reasonable doubt. If they believe that there is a possibility that this four-year-old out in Boston, who clearly was alive after the alleged death of Kate, could be her, that's not an imaginary doubt. That's not an unreasonable doubt. That is a reasonable doubt. Uh, the evidence that they have submitted supports the letter. It supports the position of an accident, or at best, if you believe that there was some act that Sean did that raises uh, his culpability, it's at most to an involuntary manslaughter, a gross negligence. Um, there was testimony, again, not only from Ariel or from Elena Campbell or even Dan Ruba that Sean was calm, he didn't argue, he wasn't violent. The disputes, again, never arose to anybody ever being arrested for domestic violence. He didn't force the issue of adoption and abortion, even though they want you to believe that that was his motive, that he didn't want the kid, and we're going to force those issues. Ariel's own testimony, which they want to say, well, it was puppy love on and off, all of this, was that during the pregnancy and after Kate was born, their relationship was getting stronger. That she was, he was over there for 30 days in a row leading up to this. And they try to say there was just one incident where he changed her and one incident where he fed her. That wasn't her testimony. It was that when she went to work, he would come over and watch her. He would be a father. He would change her, feed her, bathe her. Um, he was bonded with her. He said, you know, if we don't do this ad adoption sooner rather than later, I'm becoming attached to her and that's going to be very difficult for me. Um, he was a good dad both to Haley and Kate. There's been no testimony otherwise. Um, these are not actions of someone that is planning or intending to kill his daughter. Um, 
they say that, well, Sean's parents, they didn't want Sean to have uh, another baby with Kate, um, that there were concerns. Those are rational concerns as well. If a parent doesn't like who their child is dating because the police have been called over there numerous times and they see them fight and all of those things, that doesn't mean that they were pressuring Sean in any way. And the, own, the testimony of Ariel, was, of Ariel was that, well, actually, Sean and I, we didn't really care what his parents thought or said. We were going to do our own thing. We're our own people. Um, he went and took his DNA that morning. Again, why would you do that if you're planning on or intending to kill your daughter? He left Ariel's apartment when he drove away at some time around 1.10, um, not knowing that was Kate, Kate was in the car. There's arguments that you can believe one way or the other, but there's no actual evidence to say that he didn't or that he knew that she was in the car. They want you to guess. Uh, we weren't there. Nobody else was there. And there was testimony that she was unbuckled, and when Sean drove away, Sean wasn't, or uh, Kate wasn't crying. They want you to believe that, well, Kate cries, and so she had to have cried during that, I mean, 10 minute span, and so he would have known that she was there. He went to Wendy's, which is exactly what he said he was going to do. Um, something that Ariel admitted to, that yeah, he did mention that he was going to Wendy's. He was angry. He was upset, they argued all day, and he got in his car and drove away. He believes the car seat's still behind him because that's a way that he's going to have to come back and deal with these issues. And all of a sudden, Ariel starts calling his phone, calling it repeatedly, something that she does, and his response is he shuts off the phone. He had gone into Wendy's, got his food, came back out, and is sitting there to eat, and the phone's going off, and he can't get it out of his pocket because the seat's there. He shuts off the phone, he goes silent for two hours, and his letter says that he opened up the door and jerked it out and what's described in the letter, you know, is what occurred. There is no evidence to say that that's not what happened. We then have these, uh, they say don't believe it because it doesn't fit their case, but they haven't produced any evidence otherwise. They say it couldn't happen that way, that it's not possible, but they haven't produced any evidence to show that it's not possible. Um, they look at the letter that um, it was mad at you for that day, for everything. Uh, this isn't his feelings necessarily on that day. It's looking back over all of the events. Um, that he, it didn't seem real, he couldn't think, he was in shock. Um, he's saying that, you know, had Kate been strapped in, had Kate not been left in the car, you know, this would have never happened. He's replaying these scenarios over in his head in writing this letter. Um, the letter describes uh, an act of panic or of shock. Um, and then we have, again, the two hours that he drives around. He doesn't dispose of the car seat, the diaper bag, the clothes. He puts them at most in the trunk or in his pocket. Those aren't actions of a scared person or someone that's uh, trying to, or those are actions of a scared person or someone that's confused that isn't sure what to do after a horrible accident. It's not the acts of a murderer, of someone that intended to do this act. He would flee. They didn't know where he was for two hours. He would keep going. He's not going to return home and when told to call the police, he may have waited for 10, 15 minutes. Again, not unreasonable that somebody that's dealing with this situation would delay calling the police, but he calls. Why would somebody that intentionally killed his child, committed a murder that makes him look like he's this horrible person, call the police? He has the opportunity to flee, to dispose of everything else. Um, the police don't come out there for a half hour. He waits around. Those are the actions of a young man dealing with the scenarios that were outlined in the letter. Um, when they arrive, he's pacing, but he answers those questions. He's cooperative. He doesn't fight. He doesn't resist. Um, and he doesn't lie about the clothes in their pocket. He gave some different accounts of what happened. Um, but again, that's of a panicked 21-year-old dealing with the situation outlined in the letter, not a murder. 
Um, he's having theories of murder thrown at him by Detective Posma. Detective Hansen, in his investigation, says that he's going to make sure that the piece of crap doesn't walk the street again. Those are all things that, having heard, I wouldn't talk. I don't think anybody else would talk. As the investigation goes along and he's given these transcripts and hears those things, they have their theory that this was a murder and that was their theory from the beginning. Uh, the facts support that this was an accident, nothing more. However, if you believe that Sean's actions were grossly negligent, that he could have avoided injuring Kate by using ordinary care, ordinary care, then this case only rises to that of an involuntary manslaughter. The prosecution doesn't have any evidence to prove otherwise. Dead, and then they want you to be the prosecution wants you to decide this case on a motion. Most of their op or closing statement was emotions for Kate, emotions for uh, everybody that was going on and that they need justice. But we're not to decide this on emotions or on sympathy, but on the facts. Uh, the facts are that his phone was shut off for two hours and nobody knows what happens. They want you to guess at what happened. They want to make you Try to come up with your own scenario and cement and thrown in a river that she was fed to the coyotes or any of those things, but there is no evidence. They have not produced anything to prove that that is the case. They, the evidence is that he aerial or that Kate was with Sean when he left the apartment and that we have the letter describing what occurred and nothing to say that that's not what happened. They just want you to guess. They want your emotions to take over to decide this case. They haven't proven a second degree murder beyond a reasonable doubt. They haven't proven a death beyond a reasonable doubt. And they haven't proven that Sean knowingly created a situation where death or great bodily harm, that he knew that that was going to happen. Again, that's something where shooting a, discharging a weapon into a crowd. There's not necessarily the, that would be knowing that there is a possibility of great bodily or harm or death by doing that act or shooting a firework into a crowd. Grabbing a car seat, when you open the door and grab the car seat and the, in his letter that, you know, she fell out and that he picked her up and that she was dead, there's nothing to say that that didn't happen. But that's not creating a knowing situation where there was a death that was likely. Uh, in this case, I would argue that there's reasonable doubt, uh, which has been outlined throughout my closing of different uh, issues where there is uh, reasonable doubt. It's not an imaginary doubt. It's reasonable based on all of the facts and the evidence that were, was presented to you. Um, emotions, imagination, and guesses are what the prosecution wants you to use, not the evidence that's been presented. They have motive, but motive doesn't have to be proven, and their motive is a theory. The facts don't necessarily fit their motive. They're trying to put together a picture of the facts that they have, plus the emotions that you're going to have because there is a baby missing or dead, to get a conviction here. Guesses is what to happen on June 29th from 117 to about 318 while Sean's phone was turned off is nothing more than a guess. They haven't given anything uh, to show that the reasonable scenario that was in the letter isn't possible. If the letter and everything in there is possible, that is not a second degree murder. At most, it's an involuntary manslaughter. And I would argue to you that it was an accident. And so in deciding this case, again, rely on the evidence, rely on the facts, Set your emotions aside, and we're going to ask that you do what's right in this matter and return a verdict of not guilty. Rebuttals with the prosecution. Thank you, Your Honor. John, I desperately need to use the matter. <laughs> um, we must take that break. Uh, we'll take that. Uh, could try to keep it to uh, 10 minutes or less. Uh, and let's be back here by. Uh, Thank you.
to discuss this matter amongst yourselves uh, or let anyone discuss it with you or in your presence. And uh, you must not uh, listen to any news reports or any internet information about this matter. And we will come back and conclude uh, the arguments and the instructions and at that point during the case of you. We're in recess until 11.25.